verse in, in chapter 3, and then uh, we're going to look at one more verse. John 3, I want you to look at this. Uh, verse 13, no one has ever gone into heaven, and your translation might be different than mine. No one has gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, son of man. Verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, the Son of Man must be lifted up. That everyone who believes in Him might have eternal life. And then we have John 3, 16. Then I want you to go to John 12 uh, for a moment, and then we're going to take the questions that have been asked. This is right after Jesus entered the holy city in His triumphal entry the week before He was crucified. And then... Uh, Verse 27, Jesus speaks, My heart is troubled, what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to earth. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I had glorified it, and would glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard it, said, and, heard, and said that it thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. Jesus said this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for the judge of this world, the prince of this world, Satan, be driven out. But I want to focus on verse 40, 32. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. If you've been with us for the last three weeks, you know that the people in the congregation have been turning in questions. Uh, if I had one question I could ask God, what would it be? And we've been answering those in the sermons. And we got some one-on-one -on -one questions this morning that was pretty wonderful too. So I took three today, and here we go. And this one was one of the hardest ones. Here we go. How can we help a person go from believing as a God to believing in the saving faith in Jesus? That's a tough question. And the reason that's a tough question, I prayed a lot about how to ask God many times. Please give me an answer for this question. Because there are many people on this planet who believe in God but have not accepted Jesus. There are many people who say, I believe in God, but don't believe in His Son. Before I answer this question, I want to give you a bottom line. <clears throat> I think sometimes people should just bring tomatoes to church, get ready to throw up the preacher when he says something on the with <clears throat> A person who believes in God, and there are millions, but does not believe in Jesus, and there are millions, will not go to heaven. Not going to happen. Doesn't matter your background. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Why in the world would God let someone in heaven who rejected his son? Why would God do that if there was another way? Because there is no other way. Amen. There's just not one. <coughs> Why would God allow His Son to be crucified if it wasn't necessary? But it was necessary. We've got to start with that. Okay. And prayerfully, there are so many verses that tell you that a person's not going to heaven unless they're in Christ. So... I can say right now, make sure you're in Christ, so you're not going. I can say that, biblically. But let's look at, this is much, the best I could do. Okay. <clears throat> First, a person must understand God's nature. If you believe in God, or since you believe in God, you have to understand the nature of God. All right? Because most of my ministry, I have been asked this, I have been, and people are most proud of this. Well, I don't think a loving God would send people to hell. Well, that's true. When you read Matthew 25, 41, you'll find out that hell wasn't made for people. It was made for the devil and his angels. God didn't make it for people. People just choose to go there. God did all they could to keep us out. A better question would be, why would a holy God allow someone in heaven who has sin on, on them? That's just as good a question, I would suppose. But when we understand the nature of God, we've got to start here. God is love. Right? Is that true? You agree with that? God is love? We like that. 
But we don't like it as much when a preacher says God is just and God is holy. Do you agree with that? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Wonderful. You see, I liked it when my dad was loving me. But I didn't like it when my dad was just with me. I hated it. As a matter of fact, when he was loving me, I thought, what a great dad. But when he was disciplining me, I thought, what a terrible dad. But God is love and God is holy. Which one is he most of? Neither. You cannot go through this life saying, oh, I love God because he's loving, but he's, he's not just. And you can't go through this life saying God is, God is just, but he's not loving. He's both. So that's God's nature. We've got to start there. Then it trickles down. After we understand God's nature, a person must understand God's predicament. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, there was a predicament. God wanted to love them, but God also wanted to condemn them. His love said, I want to embrace you. His justice said, I want to condemn you. And that was a problem. Now, humans don't have an answer for that problem, but God has never been perplexed, never had his back to a wall, not knowing what to do. So God's predicament was solved with God's solution. God's solution. <clears throat> and God's solution was the Father and the Son and the Spirit got together in eternity in the halls of heaven and decided that the Son would become flesh, become a baby, would live a life of perfection and would satisfy God's justice and would go to the cross and die on the cross. And when he died on the cross, he would say, it is finished. Not I am finished, but it is finished, the solution, the plan. And when Jesus came as a baby and lived as a man and went through the process of carrying out God's plan, and he died on the cross, then the predicament was solved. Stay with me. First, must understand God's freedom. When Jesus died on the cross, God was free to love man again because justice had been satisfied. I don't want to go any further till we all understand this truth. When Jesus died on the cross, the God who was just was now the God who is free to love again. Are we okay with that? Amen. Seven or eight people are okay with that. <clears throat> So understanding God's freedom to love us uh, was so important. You see, uh, there's a passage that I hope I have to you. Yeah, this is an awesome passage. Uh, God is just, and He's also the justifier. <coughs> Holy God came down and saved us from our sins. And was a justifier of others. Okay, let's go. All right. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Patty, yeah. you you doing this? Yeah. Can someone take your place for a second. Sure. Get some time. So part of the answer is a uh, great heart. The people you want to talk to. I have a teacher to stand right there. It, with the answer to the question, you pray hard that the people who believe in God and don't believe in Jesus will keep it as long as they can. Have a teachable spirit because if they don't have a teachable spirit, a approachable spirit is not going to work. But love them and pray for them and teach them that, uh, you know, it's necessary. Point them to the cross. That's why I had you read verses on the cross because Jesus said, if I'm lifted up, if you talk about the cross, I'll draw all men to me. So if a person has a teachable spirit and believes in God, and you tell them about the cross, that, that Jesus fulfilled God's plan, then uh, they might understand and have a saving faith in Jesus. Okay? Let's suppose, there are, there are guests here, I just need to understand, have you understand something. This is the most obedient my daughter's been in years. This is <laughs> Well, there's times when she hasn't been in some pants. <laughs> <laughs> We haven't got time to talk about the times she needed to be disciplined and never got it. Sorry, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be loving in church. 
I write the sermon. You don't write the sermon. <laughs> okay. Let's suppose. Suppose that Patty. The, first of all, you suppose that I am the circuit court judge. That's <laughs> dreaming, isn't it? <laughs> suppose I'm a judge in the county, and suppose this this girl was caught going through town at 100 miles an hour. <laughs> suppose I said. Okay. So she appears before me. <coughs> and I say, Patty and Recolet, did you go through town at 100 miles an hour? I say yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, Patty and Recolet, are you guilty or not guilty? Say guilty. And as a judge, I say, <laughs> guilty. One hundred, no, let's make it one thousand dollar fine or sixty days in jail. That's the sentence. I was going to put on a, on the choir robe. I take my robe off. Come down here. Take out my wallet. Take out the money. And pay the fine. Listen carefully. If I'd have said, Patty Ann, because you're my daughter, I'm going to let you go. That would not have been just. They've been wrong. <laughs> Judges are doing it every day, but it's still wrong. If I had said, pay it, I don't care, it wouldn't have been loving. But as her father, when I stepped down and paid her fine, stepped down from where I was and paid her fine, that is what Jesus did when Amen. he stepped down Thank and took care Jesus. Thank of you, our Jesus. Thank you. Justice was served and love took over. Are we together on this? Yeah. Okay, because I want to tell you something. <coughs> Something that hit me when I was writing this message that hasn't hit me before. Who did Jesus die for? Everyone. All of us. Keep going. Sinners? Yeah. Everybody? Everyone. I haven't heard I haven't heard the word yet. The world. I'm so glad I haven't heard it yet, so I can teach you something. <laughs> really? God died for all mankind. God died for sinners. God, uh, Jesus died for all of us. He died for everybody. He died for himself. Jesus died for God. He gives me chills. Jesus died for his father, so his father was free to love again. It never hit me. So I wrote this message. The worst thing he died for sinners, he did, but he died for his father. So his father could say, you know what? I'm satisfied now. And I can love you now. So somehow you get that get that people. Have you thought of it that way? Mm -hmm. Maybe not. I I think I have to have So that's that's how to do that. Okay? Put them to the cross and pray for them and teach both spirit and just tell them. There's no alternative. Second question. Are you waiting for a certain group to accept you before the end? That's a great question also. And I want to start by saying this. When Jesus decides to come again, nothing's going to stop him. Amen. As a matter of fact, God has already set the timetable. If you're cooking, we'll say it this way, he set the timer. <coughs> it's going to go off. And nothing's going to keep that from happening. Uh, but is he waiting for someone? It is my opinion. The answer to this question is, God is waiting for the last person who's supposed to accept him to accept him. Two passages come to mind. God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In 
And number two, Timoth Paul wrote to Timothy and said this, it's good and acceptable in the sight of God who will have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Since God wants to save everybody, if every person who God intends to be saved, He's waiting for that person to come to Him. All right? And when this question was asked, I started thinking about it, and there's three answers. Is there a special group of people that God's waiting for before the end comes? And here are the three answers. Number one, He's waiting for the Jews. Because God has made an agreement with the Jews, with Abraham, that they're always His people. He's a covenant God. He promised them that He would save them. And uh, the, the Jews, more Jews need to come to Jesus. And there is a ministry, if you haven't heard it before, called, called <coughs> Jews for Jesus. It's out there. And you know it's a tough ministry, and it's a slow ministry, and the reason it's a tough and slow ministry is because it's hard to convince a person who believes that they're chosen that they have to do anything. But because God has kept His promise with the Jew, He is waiting for as many Jewish people to come to Him as possible. That's first. Second group. God is waiting for His elect, those predestined to be saved. Uh, I don't know what you want to do with this. I guess this is, a, this is the place to explain it. But from the beginning of creation, God knew exactly how many people would come to Him. Before God said, let there be light, and let there be seas, and let there be giraffes, and let there be spiders, and let there be, let there be, God knew the exact number of people at the end of time who would be in Christ. He knew that. And God is never, never, never wrong. And since he's never wrong, there's a certain percentage, there's a certain number of people who are going to come to him. And when they come to him, then the end will come. That doesn't mean you haven't got free will. Doesn't mean you haven't got free choice. Not, not at all. If God knows that I'm going to touch his shoulder, but I chose to touch his shoulder, then God's going to know how many people will come to him. Because he's God. I have never met a mom who didn't know who all of her children were. If a mom can keep track of her children, why can't God keep track of his? Amen. He's gonna. So the answer to the question is he's waiting for the Jewish people to come. He's waiting for those who are chosen to come. And the third answer is that's the elect. He's waiting for you to come. <laughs> If you haven't come yet, he's waiting for you. If you're still breathing, you can still come to him. If you're still alive, you can come to him. I'm not sure how patient he's going to be. I'm not sure how long you're going to live. But he's still waiting for you if you haven't come to him yet. If we're not careful, this is going to turn out to be a halfway decent sermon. <laughs> Number three. Here's a third. Yes? I want. I thought you were down on what it says the Muslims. Need to come the to Muslims are the people who believe in God but don't believe in the deity of Jesus and so they need to come to Jesus. He loves Muslims. But, he lo but he's just. And his plan is Jesus. And if people try to get to heaven apart from Jesus, they're not going to get that. I would be disappointed in God if he said, I had my son crucified but you can find another way. I don't like that. Third question. Why does so many mansions in heaven when everyone is praising you for all eternity? Uh, I like that question because uh, I like preaching about it. The reason there are many mansions in heaven is because the Bible says there are going to be mansions in heaven. But the person who asked that question wants to know why. Why would God do that? Okay. Uh, first of all, the word mansion in the original language is dwelling place. So you can call it a tent, tabernacle, dwelling place, but there are many of them. And there are three reasons as to why there are many mansions in heaven. First reason is because God loves to give. God's always been a giver. God made the sun and it gives. God made the moon and it gives. God made the earth and it gives. God made the air and it gives. God made uh, animals and all the things, the sunset and sunrise. These things all give. And then he made man and man's supposed to give. God's a giver, and He loves giving, and so we know God so loved the world that He gave. The second reason there are many mansions is this one. God loves to reward. He loves to reward people. Uh, you know what? 
we've talked quite a bit in sermons this, over this year about how sometimes the Christian life can be really tough and rough. And how things come into our lives that we would never choose. God knows that. God knows when you struggle. And God knows about the cancer. And God knows about the operation. And God knows when they lost the baby. And God knows all these things. And since God knows how much we suffer, God delights in saying, you know what, Christian? Even though you accepted me and times weren't easy, I've got a reward for you for hanging in there. I've got a reward for you just for staying with me. I've got a reward for you for not giving up on me, for still believing me, even though there are a lot of people who, when tragedy comes, they say, I don't, I don't like God anymore. But you didn't do that, so I have a reward for you. A passage comes to mind. And they mentioned, oh, take that one down. They're not ready for that. <laughs> the Bible says many times, well done, good and faithful servant. Mm -hmm. Enter into the joys of your Lord. God delights in giving a uh, reward. Okay, we'll do this. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Just being me. Many nations have it because God doesn't ever want anyone to think there won't be room. That's why he said many. <clears throat> because a lot of times, you know, we went to Disney World, I don't know how many years ago, and there's this huge theater where you can go in and watch a, a movie. And I saw several hundred people uh, waiting. I thought, my goodness, is there going to be room in there? And we got in there. There was so many, so much room, I couldn't, I couldn't believe how big that theater was uh, because there was room. And so... <coughs> God wants us to, he, Jesus said many mansions, so no one will walk around saying, uh, is there room for me? Uh, you know by now that our son is married. Uh, he tried three times to get here to get married. He wanted to get married when he tried three times to get here. <laughs> the reason he tried three times, he was always on standby, on an airplane. And if I could get canceled because there wasn't room for him. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions, so no one would be on standby. No one would have to wait. And please catch this. Please get this. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions, because he knew there would be people later on, especially a certain group, who would tell people, there's not room in heaven to fill them. There's only room for 144,000 people. Jesus knew that would happen. So he said, there's many mentions. Listen, folks. There have been over 30 million babies aborted since Roe v. Wade. Every single one of those babies will be in heaven. Amen. How in the world can someone say, there's only room for 144,000 when 30 million babies are going to What about all the people who believe in God we talked about who've never heard of Jesus? The God who just spoke universe into being can make heaven roomy enough for all the people who are going to go there. Amen. God's a big God. He's not a little Amen. God. God's an almighty God. He's not a restrained God. God's an awesome God. Amen. Well, we'll wrap this up with a couple truths, I guess. So, my Aunt Lucille has passed away, my dad's sister. While she was alive, she wanted to join a church. The church board got together and voted twice and turned her down. She couldn't be in the church. She wept. She had been married three times and the church voted that she couldn't be in the church. Mm -hmm. I was so excited to find the passage that said, Whosoever will, let him come. And when I talked to my aunt, that whosoever will, Jesus said, anybody can come who wants to come to him. And she cried for joy. She said, I don't want to be in the church if you have a, a terrible life and a messed up life, we still want you. Because God can cure and heal and bless and, and can change lives. Yeah. He really can. And so when he says uh, there's not room, 
That's pretty dumb. Why would God love the world and make it restricted heaven? That doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, here's how I want to wrap this up, I guess. I thought about it. If you want to go to heaven, there'll be room for you. Okay. Uh, the week of tomorrow, Nancy and I are going to take some vacation, and we're going to go to Ludington. We're going to get on the SS Badger and go over to Manitowoc, Wisconsin. I made sure her life insurance was paid up. <laughs> I called last week. A lot of places, we don't use credit cards. A lot of places won't make a reservation on a credit card. The gal was very nice and she said this. I'll make a reservation. I said, we're coming. Once somebody dies, it's an emergency. We're coming. She said, I'll make a reservation for you. I know Monday morning at 9 o'clock that we can take the car on the SS Badger and go across Lake Michigan because someone gave me a confirmation. When you give your life to the Lord Jesus, you've got a confirmation. It's yours. And his promise is greater than whoever promised me that. Across the <coughs> Folks, Jesus went to heaven and he left the door open. Let's stand.